Hi, this is Professor Fernandez. We are working on uh, class notes A in lesson 19. So in this example, what I want to do is show you how we can use the eigenvector eigenvalue approach to sketch the face portrait for a linear system of two ODEs. So um, I've already provided the eigenvalues and eigenvectors here, but certainly we know how to calculate these based off of the work that we've done in previous lessons. So the first thing I'm going to do is draw the face plane, and I'm going to start filling out information on this face plane as we go through this video about uh, you know what the orbits look like. So um, first, the first thing I'm going to do here is draw this eigenvector. So this is the vector 1, 4. So I'm going to start at the origin, go one unit to the right, and then four units up, and draw a vector there. Okay, and then I'm going to draw this second vector. Um, let's use a black color here. So this is negative 1, 1. Start at the origin, um, go one unit to the left, and then go one unit up. So that's that vector. And one thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to get rid of the... Oops, I guess I'll have to do them over. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the um, vector directions because we'll see in a minute that the direction of the orbits through this, uh, these vectors depends more on the eigenvalues. Um, second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to extend these vectors to lines. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. All right. So you can already see that sketching the face portrait in this way really tells you, um, uh, asks you to think more broadly about what the eigenvectors represent. And let's now move to that phase where I explain why I'm doing all of this. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I'll mention is that um, we know the eigenvalues are distinct. They are not the same number. So based off of class notes B in, uh, I believe it was the last lesson, the pr uh, lesson previous to this, we know that the general solution is C1 e to the lambda, in this case, 1 t times its eigenvector plus C2 e to the lambda t times its eigenvector, right? And this goes along with the general form of solutions to systems of the form x dot equals ax that we had discussed in the previous lesson. So what I'm going to do now is use this form to analyze the face portraits here on the left-hand side on the face plane. So what am I going to do? First, I am going to recognize the fact that C1 and C2 here we would only know based off of the initial conditions. So, you know, someone gives me a, gives us initial conditions, we'd be able to solve for C1 and C2. Um, because C1 and C2 are arbitrary, and I want to draw the face portrait, I want to consider all possible initial conditions. All right, so among that ginormous set of initial conditions, there is one initial condition where C2 is zero. So let's suppose that C2 equals zero. So I'm looking only at this part of the solution. All right, so what would happen? Well, this part of the solution, notice that C1e to the negative t, that's a number, and it multiplies the eigenvector 1, 4. In other words, I have some number, let's call it alpha times 1, 4. And that would be the solution in the case in which you know, there's some special initial condition that makes C2 0. So what does this mean? This means that the solution in this case would be parallel or anti-parallel, I'll tell you what that means in a minute, to the eigenvector 1, 4. So parallel is if alpha is positive, meaning, you know, think of alpha as like maybe 2 or, you know, 17. These are all vectors, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, point in the same direction as 1, 4, but they're scaled. So this one is twice as long as 1, 4. This one is 17 times as long as 1, 4. The eigenvector 1, 4 up here I had put in blue. So now you can see why I've extended this line in the face portrait. Because when C2 is 0, this part of the face portrait right, comes from thinking of all other possible initial conditions that would make C1 a positive number. And that is going to trace out this entire line in the face portrait. All right. And the second thing that I want to point out here is that if alpha is negative, then we have something like instead of you know, these little toy examples down here, 
we would have something like you know negative 3 times 1 4 or negative 21 times 1 4 when you multiply a vector by a negative number it flips the direction so rather than going to 1 4 up here I would flip the direction down here so that explains why I've extended the eigenvector in this uh, part of the phase plane great so now we see where those lines come from and now let's talk a little bit more about um, the direction on these um, on this portion of the face plane so if I go back to what it looks like right here um, x of t equals this again I'm assuming I'm still in this case when c2 is 0 um, notice what happens as t goes to infinity okay as t goes to infinity doesn't matter what the c1 value is e to the minus t that goes to zero okay so this is going to approach the origin so what that tells me that's is that suppose i start up here on my eigen uh, on my face plane then eventually this solution is going to go to the origin so i'm going to put arrows here to sig to uh, to signify that suppose i start down here then eventually this solution is going to go to the origin because it didn't matter what C1 was, right? For every single C1, this limit is 0, 0. So I'm going to put arrows over here. All right, so I'm going to try to erase a lot of this stuff to declutter it so we can see more clearly um, later on when I finish the face portrait. Um, so I'm just going to put neat little arrows going toward the origin. <clears throat> Great, so that completes the analysis for this first chunk, where I am assuming that C2 is 0. So let me now go back and suppose that C1 is 0, and do a very similar analysis to see what type of behavior um, is going to be represented for the other eigenvector. So suppose that C1 um, equals 0. All right, so again, that might happen because of some specific choice of initial conditions. If C1 is 0, then I'm looking only at this part of the solution. So I'm looking at x of t equals C2 e to the minus 6t times minus 1, 1. And then now we can speed things up a little bit. Now that we've done this type of analysis already, we can say, oh, so first of all, if I look at the limit as t goes to infinity of x of t, then that again is 0, 0 because this is a decaying exponential. It doesn't matter what C2 is, positive or negative. Um, so I'm going to go back to my face portrait, and wherever I start on this line, I am going to be pushed by the system to the origin. So I'm going to put those direction arrows there. Great. Um, and I, <clears throat> I could analyze it in the same way that I did earlier to convince you that, you know, if you start with this eigenvector, as you change the C value, if it's positive, then it scales it to give you this part of the line. Um, if it's negative, then it scales it to give you this part of the line. So again, that explains why, why this, is a, this is a line and not just this singular vector here. Okay, and then what's the next thing I'm going to do? So I'm going to say, all right, all right, so we have done a lot of good work. We know what happens if you start essentially on this line or on this line. Um, but what if you start somewhere else? What if you start like over here? Okay, so let's talk about that. So this is the second part of this analysis. Um, let me look at the limit as t goes to infinity of x of t. All right. So this is a decaying exponential. So this is also a decaying exponential. So I am going to get 0, 0. But before I get to 0, 0, let me talk about which term, which of these two terms dominates. So what do I mean by that? Um, <clears throat> to do that, let me just remind you that e to the minus t is 1 over e to the t. And e to the minus 6t is 1 over e to the 6t. So as t gets really, really big, right? think of t being like you know, a million. Um, which one of these two terms, this one or this one, is smaller? And your answer should be this one, because if I have t equals a million, this is 6 million. And then I'm exponentiating that, which would be a gigantic number. Um, and then 1 divided by that would be really, really tiny. This one, on the other hand, I'm just exponentiating a million, right? Which is still a gigantic number, but not as gigantic as e to the 6 million. Um, so this number will be tiny, but not as tiny as this one. <clears throat> Excuse me. So long story short, what does that teach us? That teaches us that for this system, 
um, when t is going to infinity, the solution is approximately c1 e to the minus t 1, 4. Because again, this second term with the e to the minus 6t is much, much smaller, much, much quicker. In other words, for a given t value, this term is you know nearly zero much faster than this term. Okay, so what does that tell us? That tells us that um, the larger that t gets, the closer that this full solution now, I haven't assumed that c1 or c2 are zero, the closer that this full solution gets to this part of the solution. And what was this part of the solution? This was the part of the solution that was parallel or anti-parallel, opposite direction, to the vector 1, 4. And that's the blue line, right? So conclusion, let's suppose that I start um, somewhere else in the phase plane. Perhaps, I don't know, um, let's use a different color. Let's suppose I start here. And I just you know, start my stopwatch um, to measure time. And I just let time flow. Well, eventually, the solution is going to be very close to the line that is um, extended from the eigenvector 1, 4. So eventually, I'm going to be here. Um, <clears throat> if I were to start somewhere over here, eventually, I'm also going to be here. Um, if I were to start over here, eventually, I'm going to be here. If I were to start over here, eventually, I'm going to be here. Okay, so you can see I've kind of looked at the four um, regions that this uh, problem has been divided to. This region, this region, this region, and this region. So I've looked at those four, um, and I've just drawn some you know, random dots for the initial conditions. Great, so that's good insight. Let me now go back and do the same sort of analysis. This will be the last part of the analysis. Um, but going backwards, so what do I mean by that? What if I take t to minus infinity? Okay. Remember, we had this existence uniqueness theorem for systems of the form x dot equals ax, which told us that if you prescribe an initial condition, not only does the solution exist uh, uh, with that initial condition and is unique, but also it exists for all t from negative infinity to infinity. So if I take the limit as t goes to minus infinity, different question now, right? If t goes to minus infinity, then e to the minus t, well, minus infinity, think of like minus a million. When I do e to the minus t, actually this becomes a, 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 a e to the t, right? It doesn't become 1 over e to the t. Same thing for this second term here, e to the minus 60. This becomes e to the 60 because t is negative. So now the answer to the question of which one of these terms dominates changes. If t is something like negative a million, right, then because of this feature of this particular solution, this term would be bigger than this one. So um, that changes which term dominates. So I'm going to say as t goes to negative infinity, this x of t solution is approximately this second term. All right, and how do we interpret that? The way we interpret that is, remember, as t goes to infinity in this solution, we head toward the origin. So eventually, all solutions, um, all orbits, um, come into the origin. However, if I were to pick an orbit, maybe like, like this one right here, this little piece of the green one that I drew, if I were to pick an orbit and try to draw it backwards, then eventually I would start drawing it backwards with negative t values. And if I keep going backwards and keep going backwards, then that's how you interpret this limit as t goes to negative infinity. And what this new result is telling us is that if you keep going backwards on an orbit, then you're going to end up parallel or anti-parallel to the eigenvector negative 1, 1, which was this line over here that we had drawn initially. So if I take this orbit over here, uh, or this initial condition, and I went backwards in time, I would have to be parallel, there I'm drawing it parallel, to this line. If I take this dot up here and I go backwards, I would have to be parallel to this line. Same thing with the dot down here, parallel to this line. And then this initial condition down here, parallel to this line. Right. And now, then now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to, my best to, um, I'm going to draw this, uh, move this, this little part of the, um, 
orbit a little bit further back. Same thing with this one. So what I'm going to do now is tr try my best <laughs> to match up these dots for you, and you can kind of see what's what's going to happen. So um, if I were starting here, um, I'm going to try to come in and then match up with this uh, eigen uh, with this portion of the orbit, right? And then I, I I guess I won't try for this one down here. I'm just going to draw this. And instead, you know, move the dot over here. Choose a different initial condition. Um, and same thing for these other ones to just make it make it more clear. Um, so there we go. So I, I connect this these two parts of the orbit this way, these two parts of the orbit that way. And I guess I'll, I'll clean up this orbit over here. Okay, so then what's going on um, when we step back, right? This is a phase portrait where the orbits start parallel to this line. There we go. This is parallel to this line. And they end up parallel to the blue line. Right? I realize that the, uh, you know, the, the diagram is getting a bit um, um, busy, but that's exactly how, how face portraits look. They are, they are busy. So here I am trying my best to draw um, all of this stuff so that it, it makes sense. Um, and I'm going to encourage you and you know, I'm going to put the directions here for all these orbits. I'm going to encourage you to go to the website that we have been using in the previous lesson um, and then plot this system. So this is x dot equals minus 5x plus y, y dot equals 4x minus 2y. Plot that system, plot its direction field, um, and then start using the website from, from that I mentioned from class to so just start clicking anywhere on the direction field and the system will plot for you the orbits. And you will see exactly this um, picture for the orbits. Okay, so we're gonna do this again in the next video. And what you'll see in that video is a different looking face portrait. Um, if I had to summarize this particular face portrait, I would say that um, everything, all portions of the solution as we've shown, get sucked into the origin. Um, so this, uh, a system which has this particular phase portrait where everything gets sucked into the origin has a particular name that we will talk about later in the lesson. But let me also point out one thing that if you look back up here, right, x equals 0, y equals 0 is an equilibrium point of this system. And it actually turns out to be the only equilibrium point of this system. So this is a general feature of what's going to happen in this lesson. 0, 0 is the only equilibrium points, and based off of how the eigenvalues and eigenvectors have turned out for this system, all of the orbits are uh, culminating in uh, at that equilibrium point. Um, so to the title of this lesson, right, which is up here, classifying equilibrium points for linear systems, right? We are going to, in the rest of this lesson, give these face portraits a name, face portraits that end up looking like the one that I've just drawn. Um, we're going to call this one a stable node. So in the next video, you'll see a different face portrait for different outcomes of eigenvalues and eigenvectors for a linear system that will be classified as a different type of um, equilibrium point. Okay, so I'll see you in the next video.